All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to uh, this edition of ZK Study Club. Today, we're very happy and excited to welcome uh, JP um, Amasson, and he is the Chief Security Officer at uh, Taurus. He's going to be speaking to us today about zero knowledge proof security in practice and you know, specifically some of the lessons that he's, he's learned and, or, or things that he's observed uh, auditing several different projects in the zero knowledge space. So, JP, it's a pleasure to have you. Um, over to you. Thank you, Alex. Um, well, thank you for inviting me. I'm very happy to be to be part of the club now. Um, so I, I hope this this talk will be useful to you and to the to the ZK community. Uh, some part of it might maybe be obvious to some of you, or you may find that some part are wrong. So I'd be happy to to hear your feedback, your questions. Um, and if you don't learn much from me, maybe I will learn from you, which is also a good thing. So don't hesitate to interrupt me. And actually, yes. I, so you just said that. So now I'm going to just start by interrupting you. And I yeah. think the reason I want to interrupt you is because some people may not be aware. And I want to, I want to make sure everyone who views this later is aware of your background, because you have a background in cryptography before doing this work. And I think, you know, some people may know of some of the algorithms that you worked on. So you want to just make sure you like, can you briefly yeah. introduce some of the prior work that you've done just for context? Yeah, well, my background is in academic crypto, symmetric crypto, but the last five years or so, I've done quite a few um, security assessments. I don't want, I don't like to use the word audit, but I, I looked into many components of blockchain technology, be it wallets, consensus protocols, and more recently, ZK circuit, ZK pro systems. Uh, but yeah, I'm cryptographer by training before crypto was cool, before there's a blockchain business. So I'm a bit more old school than some of the folks. Uh, and uh, I think if I'm not mistaken, you worked on Blake, is that right? Yeah, Blake too, and Siphash is maybe what people yeah. want to know. Crypto is always cool. Yeah. So. Yeah. So yeah, guys, don't hesitate to yeah, ask your questions, interrupt me, ask some familiar names in the list. So very happy to have you all here. So I will talk about ZK proof security in practice. So in practice, I mean implementations. So more specifically, it would be about you know, non-interactive ZK arguments as opposed to interactive protocols that happen to be ZK. Uh, and I will focus more particularly on ZK snarks. So as you know, there are one class of non-interactive ZK arguments. Um, they're generally full succinct, meaning that the proof is of constant size. And verification time is essentially linear in the circuit size. Uh, as Alex mentioned in the introduction, this is based on my experience of looking for bugs um, either on a, let's say, professional capacity being paid to audit stuff or just for fun for my own interest. So my experience is mostly with proof systems that use the Graph 16 uh, proof system uh, as used in, uh, in Zcash and FICON and many other projects. And more recently, I had a chance to, to look into the technology of Alio, which uses Marlin as part of their proof system. Uh, but Marlin is just one of the components they also use Graph, graph 16. But a lot of what I'm going to say applies to other proof systems, so maybe Planck, Sonic, Fractal, you name it, and to some extent to Starks as well. So why I think it's a cool topic, um, why it's important, I believe. So first of all, because from the perspective of blockchain projects, it's a major risk. So ZK snacks in practice are relatively new, uh, relatively complex. So it's typically the recipe for non-trivial bugs, for new classes of bugs and bugs that are hard to find. And there's a lot at stake in terms of, in terms of money, in terms of tokens, in terms of data and privacy. Um, so for example, for, for Zcash, it's essential to ensure that the privacy of their users are protected. And for the layer two protocols that use SNARKs, or ZK SNARKs in ZK rollups, uh, it's also extremely important to, to have some security assurance. And maybe from my personal perspective, I think that ZK technologies are the most inter interesting crypto by far today uh, because it's, uh, well, used in practice, first of all, it's reward crypto as we say today. Uh, it's deployed at scale. There's a lot of interesting papers, a lot of good code being written. And it's intellectually interesting and refreshing. As a cryptographer that's been around for maybe 15 years, 
you know, I've used that, I've looked at so many new ciphers, new, you know, secure channel protocols, uh, new end to end encryption protocols, and it's quite boring at the end. It's always the same, but differently. So here it's a very new world that is relatively simple, but complex at the same time. So by simple, I mean that it's non interactive. So you just send one payload essentially. Um, if you compare to MPC protocols that are highly interactive, like threshold signing protocols, where you have to, to think and to reason in terms of asynchronous communication, what happens if this message is not received? How do you securely abort the protocol? Um, I don't like reasoning in, in this context, and the same for consensus protocol to some extent. Uh, but ZK snacks are also complex in the sense that many moving parts, many non trivial components. Uh, as part of zk snarts for example, polynomial commitments. And it's kind of multidimensional in terms of security because there's the famous three notions, soundness, completeness, zero knowledge, and some notions that are more tied to the application. So if you do not it of a technology using zk snarts it's not only about the proof security, it's about is the proof securely used in the context of the, of the application. Um, so, what does it mean to, you know, to think in terms, in terms of security of zk snarts in practice? So I think generally the most critical notion is soundness, soundness, the most likely to be compromised, and also maybe the most critical in case it's compromised. So soundness is about making sure that proofs which are not valid are always rejected. So you want to ensure that from the attacker perspective, it's impossible to forge a proof from scratch. To alter a proof in the sense of malleability, take a valid proof and turn it into another valid proof that would be accepted, and also to prevent the replay of proofs. Um, so you may you may think of uh, case, cases where different nullifiers were accepted as valid to replay a proof. Uh, second, zero knowledge. So I don't know at this point maybe some of you might disagree when I said that zero knowledge is less important, less critical than soundness. Um, so happy to to hear counterpoints here. Uh, but one reason why I, why I rank zero knowledge a second is um, that there's little, let's say, little leeway in leaking information because you have a succinct proof. Uh, so there's little freedom in leaking a lot of information. And even if on paper ZKNS is compromised in the sense that maybe some internal component is not as ZK as it should be. Uh, and maybe the proof is not valid in that sense, but in practice, exploiting that to leak information from the proof itself is not always trivial and not always feasible as far as I can tell. And the last one, completeness. Um, so in most of, of the cases, it's more about, well, denial of service, availability, usability. In case, for example, valid proof is not accepted, then the user is not happy and it might be exploited in, in indirect ways. And if you have systems like decentralized private computation, DPC systems, where arbitrary circuits are likely to be accepted, if certain types of programs uh, are not accepted, then it, it could be a problem as well, but presumably not as critical as uh, compromise of soundness. So at this point, do you guys have any comments, questions? There is a comment in the chat. Uh, yeah, it uh, just came in here. Yeah, so, uh, well, Victor, I can vocalize it. Uh, oh, I might as well just say, I, I just like, yeah. you're, you're kind of, you're asking if there's like, if we disagreed and I guess I was thinking like, oh, well, what about like ZK KYC systems that people, some people are proposing right now? Like yeah. I can imagine that you would actually care more about zero knowledge than in soundness in that case, uh, if you had to choose because uh, people's personal identity is being protected by these kind of systems. Um, yeah, right. Yeah. That's just kind of yeah. an interesting I, example. I, yeah, that's an example. I would just think I would distinguish between the importance of um, meeting the, the privacy properties and the, the actual likely, likelihood of them being broken, because um, I think you're right, um, JP, that um, in practice, there's quite little scope for um, the proof itself to leak much information. Um, so yeah, it, it's important to to have a proof that it doesn't leak information. But um, if, if privacy is going to leak, it's probably going to leak from 
um, other parts of the high level protocol rather than from the yeah. ZK proofs. Right. Yeah, and as you mentioned, we should see it in terms of likelihood times impact. Uh, yeah. Or impact varies a lot depending on the on the application. Okay. So now this part, just briefly from my perspective, as someone who likes finding bug and found a few, uh, maybe the problem for blockchain projects um, when you want to hire people and you want to have an external view on your project. Uh, Maybe you would agree that a common problem is that auditors have yeah, limited experience because ZKPs and proxies are relatively new, limited knowledge because you, you want people who understand both the theory to understand what, what's happening and what, what's the risk and who understand the implementation. And oftentimes you run the paper, you look at the code and you're like, okay, what is that? Because implement, implementers you know, know a few optimizations, a few tricks that are not mentioned in the paper. So you need people who can, you know, understand the code and match the code to the to the specs, and it's not always easy. And unlike some other types of protocols, we don't have a checklist, or there's no official, no documented checklist of all the bugs that can happen, all the things that can go wrong. So as an auditor, you build this based on your experience. But I think depending on the team, it's there's very few public resources online that will tell you, oh, that's the kind of bug that you want to look for. And likewise, there's very little tooling and public methodology related to, to ZK Pro. So, and I, I think most of us will agree that most of the bugs, most of the interesting bugs have been found not by external auditors, but internally by internal audits or accidentally. Um, if you took the case, I think the, the bug that uh, Ariel found in Zcash in 2019, uh, this bug was very hard to catch, uh, for example. Um, so I think this calls for a completely new approach from the auditor perspective. Um, I think that what works is to have a highly collaborative approach with the designer. So for example, have regular video calls where you know the developers, the guys who wrote the code, walk you through the code and explain what's going on and the answer of the auditor's question. And to have, for example, a chat channel where auditors can ask all the questions they have. Uh, if, you, if we think we found a bug, so before writing it in the report and spending time, ask the guys, okay, is it normal? Uh, is my understanding correct of what, what can happen? Because oftentimes I would find something that makes me a bit nervous. I'm like, okay, this shouldn't be this way. But sometimes the developers tell me, no, no, that's here for a reason, we're aware of it. But look, we can explain why it's, why it's fine. Um, and also, what I found very helpful was to do a threat analysis, a kind of threat model where I have a clear view of what are the risks, what input is controlled by the attacker, what, is, what input depends on the context, and what depends on the configuration. So what are the degrees of freedom um, from the, the perspective of the attacker? Because ultimately, you want to report useful bugs, useful risks. Uh, and the developers have to prioritize mitigation. So you want to tell them whether this can be exploited or not. Um, you don't want to tell them a list of things that as a cryptographer, you don't like to see. And also what I found extremely valuable is to try to you know, play myself, write some code, uh, play it with the code that I'm given to review, um, not try to code a complete proof from scratch, but you, know, you learn only by doing, you don't learn by reading code only. So this practical experience is super important. And I've tried to find information about bugs, about potential risks. So of, of course, in public disclosures, what people document in write-ups, what you may find in CTFs. Um, I also, also looked at the reports by other teams. I found very little useful information there, to be honest, but um, I mean, that's useful in itself. And also looking into the issue trackers of different projects, looking into the PRs. And it's not always clearly tagged as a security issue. Sometimes you have to write to, you have to look in the issues and think, okay, this might be a security bug. And then you look into the comments and you see this, it's a security bug, but uh, searching is not easy. And also some people from the community have been very helpful. Um, some of you in the these of attendees. So yeah, it's essentially the reconnaissance step that is. 
Yeah. Have you found difficulty in um, so de determining what a what a protocol is supposed to do, um, sort of, uh, whether it's documented well enough? I, I mean, I know that this is something we pay a lot of effort on um, in Zcash. It's basically my job to to document the yeah. protocol. Um, but I, I haven't seen some of the documentation for other projects. And I'm wondering, how do you go about auditing um, a project that where the documentation is sparse, shall we say? Uh, that's difficult. Uh, because the first thing I want to understand is the worst case scenario from the project perspective. What are the key assets? Uh, what they want to product? And for example, if you have inputs that come from the protocol, you know, non CS notifiers or, or things like this, uh, I, I want to understand who can control which input and how they come into play, how they interact with the, with the proof system. Um, and what I also want to know is which parameters I fixed are fixed by design and which parameters can potentially be, be changed by the users or the attackers or the, or the application. But just having a clear documentation or the protocol that matches the code is, is hard to find. Um, I think some projects would tell you, okay, we have the documentation, but uh, it's for the previous release. And what's also extremely helpful is to use consistent notations between the specs, the paper, and the code. Because uh, otherwise, you have to do this mental mapping between the notation in the code and the paper, and it's uh, it's nightmare about time. Okay. Thank you. So to, I can give very general examples of things that could go wrong in the very general workflow of a, of a proof system. So if you have a program, a computation, then you describe it in terms of a circuit. Uh, there's the arithmetic step where you turn it into a R1CS or IR uh, model, depending on your proof system. And then the actual prover it gets you approved, which is integrated in the in the application. That, that's maybe an oversimplification. Uh, so first of all, if your program is not secure in the first place, then no matter how much ZKNS, no matter how much crypto you throw at it, it won't turn it, it won't be, be secure. So you want the, the program to be secure. You want the crypto primitives to be the right ones with the good security parameters. And then you want the circuit to be equivalent to the program. Uh, which sounds obvious, but in practice, it's not always easy to realize and not always easy to test. Uh, I've seen a number of projects having vanilla version, so a non-circuit version of the logic, and having the ZK, the circuit version, and trying to compare the two to have some kind of test vector. So that's very, very useful, I guess. And then, of course, see, when you translate the circuit in a constant system, then you want the constant system, the CS, to really enforce your uh, the constraints defined by your circuit. That's what well, the definition of the constraint system. And then in the proof itself, a lot of things can go wrong. For example, having insecure components um, or not having the right properties. Let's say if you have a common mask scheme, you want it to be hiding and it's not fully hiding, uh, might be a problem. Um, and even if your proof system is, is safe in itself, then you have to make sure that, for example, the application prevents the replay of previous proofs, for instance. Um, so a few examples of how you could, for example, compromise soundness. So if your constraint system is not effectively enforcing certain types of constraints, certain type of arithmetic operations, um, if your keys are not sufficiently protected, if your secrets are protected, if the secrets from the trusted setup, if you have a trusted setup, if they're not uh, cleared after the ceremony. In terms of zero knowledge, um, you have the risk if you treat private data as public data. So in general, it's pretty clear from the application perspective what is private, what is public, but it might happen that internally you treat private data as public variable, uh, it would be a problem. And what I call metadata attacks is if you obtain knowledge um, if you gain some leakage on the internals based on the usage patterns of, um, of the other of users. So from the public on chain activity, um, you would derive, you could get some information on 
the private variables based on the usage patterns um, that you see on chain. And completeness, so what can potentially go wrong, so your constraint sensitizer might not like certain types of circuits, might not like, like certain types, certain number of variables, and might fail to give you a correct um, constraint system. Also, if you have multiple gadgets, you want to make sure that they compose correctly between each other, that in terms of, I don't know, NDNS, in terms of data type, um, they're all compatible, so to speak. Um, and maybe more prosaic concerns, so because ultimately everything is software. So you might have bugs that have little to do with crypto, with ZK proof, but just you know classical software bugs, for example, encoding bugs, uh, bugs in dependencies. So what we now call supply chain bugs. Uh, it's not only the trusted setup, but also in in all your dependency graph, making sure that there is no like of course, no vulnerable dependency, even though it might not be a huge problem depending on how you use it, but have some level of assurance on who has control on the code of these dependencies. Because if I see that a small project with three stars on GitHub is used in the ceremony of Aleo, then an attacker might be tempted to, to better sabotage it using this, uh, this dependency. Uh, and last but not least, so the on-chain software, if you have verifiers of proof running on-chain, so we know that every other day there's a big new disaster in terms of smart contract bugs. Um, that's how it is. But um, yeah, smart contract, well, what I want to say is that it's already quite hard to do you know, off-chain uh, ZK proofs. Doing it on-chain is even more complex. So I tried to break down the different components in, you know, as a kind of software stack, starting from the bottom to the platform, to the application, and trying to distinguish the different types of inputs. So that's typically how I would try to reason if I had to edit a project. So what input is really clearly adversarial? What is directly coming from the protocol, like the, the block number, for example? And what is hard-coded by the configuration? So for example, um, what the type of curve you use, uh, the number of uh, variables, this this kind of thing. Um, and I tend to observe that the biggest risk in terms of ZKNS are the application level, whereas the biggest risk in terms of completeness and soundness are the, the lower levels. Um, and each layer has its own type of risk, its own types of subcomponents. Uh, starting from the top here, so in the application, you may try to distinguish the key management, nonce management issues. Also, as an auditor, I usually like to look at the unit test at what is tested, what is not tested. Do you test the failure cases or only the success cases? Uh, how do we define the interface? Are there any potential side channels that could be exploited? Uh, to what extent can value be replayed? So of course, in the prover and verifier, there's a whole lot of components. So you know, hash functions, PRF, algebraic hash functions, algebraic commitments, um, randomness, uh, randomness interfaces. You might have uh, non-uniform distributions to to simulate. Of course, all the Merkle tree proof of membership logic uh, that is quite complex, but now people tend to to get it right. Also, the Fiat Shamir. Um, Construction. So here you want to make sure that you, you hash everything that needs to be hashed. Um, and non-trivial components such as hash to curve, polymer commitments, where we sometimes found, found some bugs. So, and at the very lower level, so you rely ultimately on your platform, your language, the version of your language, the runtime, your hardware, the microcode, all these dependencies, um, the randomness coming from your system. So I'm quite happy to see that today the randomness situation is much better than 10 years ago. We tend to have quite reliable crypto random generators, but you can still find some cases. For example, I've seen recently that the, the, the WASM um, uh, bindings, um, the WASM use of randomness for certain types of architecture was not perfect in case of a non-architecture. Um, so we still find some time to time randomness issues. Uh, what's important maybe from a designer perspective uh, and from a documentation perspective is the contracts between your different components. 
uh, what are the preconditions that you guarantee? Um, so, and what do you guarantee to, um, to the color of your function? Uh, a very typical example is the, the group membership checks. So when you receive a number that is supposed to be a scalar in a given range, um, where do you make this check? So you can make it everywhere all the time, but you don't want to make the check at every place. So what I see many projects doing is when they instantiate a group element from an integer, they do the check once, and then this group element will always be enforced to be an actual group element. And likewise, if you need to check that a group element is non-zero, um, you want to make sure that, well, typically the right thing to do is to do it as early as possible when you receive it from, um, from the application. But it doesn't hurt to do it multiple times in case a function is used in different contexts. Um, we, we tend to, um, to make another type for the, the non-zero um, thing if we're using a typed language like Rust. Okay, yeah, that's the, the ideal case because then you're sure that it won't be, it won't be zero. In general, refinement types are really useful in crypto. Okay, so to finish, I'd like to go through a few examples of bugs. So not my complete list and not all the, all the bugs that have been ever found and maybe not the most interesting ones. So at the end, I'd be happy if you guys can share some examples of bugs that um, you, you've been aware of. So this one is the one I mentioned before, the, uh, the case of uh, a missing overflow check. Um, so in that case, a nullifier was not verified to be less than the modulus. So different distinct nullifiers could be accepted that ultimately would reduce down to the same um, modular value. And the exploitation scenario here was a uh, double spend. So another missing overflow check. So in that case of a public input, um, in uh, which project was it in Oasis? And another one, so this one is interesting. I think uh, Kobe uh, mentioned it to me recently. So in this project, it was initially, uh, the check was initially set here at line uh, to 22, but a developer, removed it because they believed that it was not necessary. Whereas apparently this check was indeed necessary. Um, and I, I think that this change was not accepted. So you also have to be careful of people who want to optimize the code to save some gas and remove some, uh, some useful checks. I, I, I've got a good example um, in, the, um, in the Orchard protocol, which is uh, about to activate on um, Zcash, um, so an, an earlier version of the circuit, um, the, there's, there was this requirement in the spec that um, a, um, a particular um, value needed to be um, a non-zero group element or a non-identity group element. Um, the, this is the, if you know uh, the Zcash protocol, it's, it's GD. Um, and we had used a type for these values, which excluded zero, yeah. and that was checked correctly. But what we didn't do is uh, the circuit didn't include that check for non-zero. Oh. <laughs> um, so uh, all of the witness calculation was, um, was enforcing this, but the circuit itself wasn't. Oh. Yeah. And how did you find the, the bug? Um, Oh, so um, an auditor, uh, it, it was Kedis actually, um, they, they didn't notice the bug. They, um, they actually thought that we had um, implemented this correctly and that they said in the, the first version of um, the report that this is a potential problem, but you've implemented it correctly. And so I checked it and no, we hadn't. <laughs> um, yeah. So for another type of bug, so this one is the in an R1CS um, constraint, uh, constraint system. And it's a case where the inverse property of an element was not enforced. So you could sum it to an element that was not the inverse of the one it was supposed to be the inverse of. And the proof would have been accepted because it would not have enforced that, that constraint. So I think it was uh, um, 
also reported as a RESSEC advisory. Um, it wasn't in Hardquark. So I mean, they, they have very, very good code base, but, uh, and I think, you know, like in every project, uh, you should not judge the quality of a project by the number of bugs they have, because it might just tell you that people have been doing a good job, you know, looking for bugs in the first place. Um, was projects for which no one reports bug. Well, maybe it means that no one is looking for far bugs. So, so I just don't want yeah, people the, to get the, the, more, the more bugs I find, the more confident I am. Yeah. Mm. Uh, this one, uh, yes, credited to um, to Kobe again. So it was in uh, Merkel Merkel tree computation, and it was more language uh, issue. Um, this, the wrong symbols were used for the equality check, and then the equality check was not done. So the Merkle root uh, was not correctly compared. So an incorrect Merkle root would be accepted, and this could be used to um, to get invalid proofs uh, accepted. And uh, it was fixed uh, quite easily. Um, so this is the bug I referred to before. So this kind of bug are relatively rare because, well, I don't mean to say that there's no bugs in the papers, but the bugs in papers are quite hard to, hard to find. Uh, so in that case, uh, Ayat Gabizon found a problem in the paper in the description of the trusted setup. And the problem was that uh, some values that were actually toxic and supposed to be clear were not cleared. And it could later be exploited to, um, to the double spend ultimately. Uh, is that correct? That's exactly correct. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Um, and I think so. The Zcash team did a very nice job, first of all, disclosing this to the project raising the same code base. Because now we have the problem that once you find a bug in your code, that it might not only be your code. So, in terms of disclosure, what do you do? Do you quickly fix it for you? But if you fix it and disclose it, then some people might exploit it to uh, well, exploit other projects. So, you want to try to be as responsible as possible, but also to protect your own uh, project. So that might not be easy to manage. Yeah, we, we had to basically um, to define some cutoff in um, market cap of um, the, the projects that we wanted to, uh, to inform. Yeah, but if I had not found that bug, I wonder when it would have been found, if, if at all. Um, so I. The, the issue was that the BCTV 14 paper didn't have a complete security proof. Um, yeah. we, uh, I think it would have been found one way or the, or the other because... Um, it, it wasn't just a security find... proof, right? Like the protocol wasn't in the main body of the paper. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. It, it, it was an appendix um, and it was assumed to be secure based on being similar to, to PHGR 13. Um, which which did have a correct security proof, or correct as far as I know. Um, so I think I think we were always going to um, try to produce a, a rigorous proof and check it thoroughly. Um, so it's a matter of time before that bug was found. Um, yeah, I, I think that. We didn't really have a lot of choice but to use BCTV 14 because um, it, it was basically the only proving system that um, that met our performance um, requirements when we launched Zcash. I wonder if we shouldn't spend more time um, reviewing proofs um, and papers generally as opposed to to only only code. Yeah, um, definitely. And. You know, when, when papers are submitted to conferences, uh, I mean, reviewers are doing their best, but oftentimes part of the proofs are in appendix and uh, yeah, it takes think, many eyes to, to review a proof correctly. So, so I think part of the issue in that paper, it was just, it was trying to do a lot. Um, it was, it was trying to do too much actually, because uh, zero cache is um, a complicated protocol in itself and the proof system that was a modification of PHGR 13 should have been probably a separate paper. I don't I mean, know whether to that some paper degree, I... publishable. Yeah. Oh, go on. 
yeah. yeah to some degree i don't even really think it's the job of reviewers to be finding these kind of cryptographic bugs like the job of a reviewer is to decide whether a paper is interesting or not and it's more the engineering community that has misunderstood that i agree yeah yeah i i, I don't rely on peer review to find bugs because it doesn't <laughs> And I've seen in the case of MPC protocols, of interactive protocols, some proofs being written with certain, you know, communication assumptions, which are not necessarily, you know, correct in practice. So, yeah. So the next bug, um, this one is more the application level, um, was disclosed uh, by a stack. And what's about the well, nonce management about the, the choice of, of nonces. So the proof system was fine, apparently. It was just the, the way inputs were chosen. So like in the first example, they think they use nullifiers instead of um, account nonces. And in the second one, um, the nonce was not included at all in the, in the encrypted not. Um, Uh, this bug, well, no, I don't want really to, to call it a bug, but it's uh, a, a scenario whereby you cannot completely break zero knowledge, but you can exploit some, you know, usage pattern information and leverage it to to try to compromise the zkns. But um, I, 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 I have to um, I have to be careful about how I phrase this, yeah. but um, the, this this paper. Is a very poor quality paper. <laughs> they they do not understand the protocol. Um, the the original attacker um, relied on a, a property of the protocol that it, it doesn't have. Um, and when we tried to communicate with them about this, um, let's just say that that communication was not very productive, um, and the yeah. problem wasn't on our side. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, the, the, the paper is uh, a bit um, yeah surprising in terms of uh, the claims being made, but uh... the the claims are um, I I'm pretty sure false. Yeah. <laughs> but nonetheless, this type of attack might be extremely relevant uh, if um, you know that two inputs might be similar or might have some type of relation. Um, and I, I don't know if the proof system, if the if the security proofs uh, take these potential leaks in, uh, into account. Um, like, you, for example, in case of shielded transaction, you know the potential relation between two amounts. You know that this one is bigger than that amount. Um, yeah, it's, it's certainly very difficult to right. um, to analyze a, 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 a protocol that has a transparent um, aspect when. Yeah you're trying to analyze it for privacy yeah and um, we've we've taken that into account when we're designing the um the um unified addresses for the new version of uh, for nu5 um the next upgrade of zcash so the the default privacy policy for that if you're using a um a unified address in a transaction is for everything to be private okay okay and I think is it the last, no, maybe not the last bug. Um, so this one was a kind of zero knowledge bug that was kind of impacting ZKNS, um, but not very clearly. So they were missing some, um, you know, random blinding factors. So I think that on paper, uh, it kind of compromised your knowledge in terms of the proof not being valid anymore, but I'm not sure, and I don't think it was really leaking data in the in the in the proof in the Blanc proof. Um, so maybe Blanc people will will notice better than me, but um, that was my basic understanding of uh, of this bug. I mean, it doesn't mean it should should not be fixed, but uh, um, this one was in again in the disclosure from from Astex, so where it was a bug in the Merkle tree. Um, competition that was a DOS bug, but a kind of bad bad one in the sense that it could potentially freeze the ability to verify ZK um, ZK rollups. Um, 
So maybe I can skip the technical details. It's uh, well, a tree computation bug. Uh, that, that that blog post, I think, um, it actually it wasn't um, entirely obvious from the summary of the post, but there were two bugs there. I think the other one was a soundless bug. Okay. And maybe this last is not because it's interesting, uh, not because it's clever, uh, but it's when I recently found in the implementation of the, the Cairo language. Uh, and it's a problem that some valid signatures are being rejected. Um, and my understanding is that the developers believe that the risk was negligible. Whereas from my perspective, it's not that negligible, it's uh, two to the power minus 54. So meaning that you can forge a signature that could be actually valid but rejected by the um, by the on-chain uh, contract derived from um, from the Cairo implementation. Uh, I haven't yet got the feedback from um, from the Cairo team. Uh, I'm curious to to know what they what they think of this. And actually, the bug was that they enforce the um, certain values to be less than two to the uh, number of bits in the exponent. Uh, in the modulus, as opposed to being less than the than the modulus, and I, I don't know why they do this. Maybe to save um, save gas. Uh, is this they're doing it in a circuit, or they're doing it outside the circuit? Because because um, doing a track against a, a specific value rather than a um, a power of two in a circuit is about um, what do it. There's an optimized way to do it that depends on the number of set bits, but um, yeah, that, that was my guess. It's, yeah, it's roughly about one and a half times faster. So maybe it was a performance hack. Yeah. Um, and other types of issues that we've noticed um, or that we've thought about, uh, for example, in person uh, commitment, person hashes making sure that your bases are unique and correctly generated. Uh, we've seen situations where you know, the padding, when the hashing or commitment, there was no, no padding at all because you accept a, a value of fixed size. But at some point, then you start using it with a value of variable size, then you want to have padding, otherwise it's completely insecure. Uh, some small bugs that um, we noticed was, for example, in the Poseidon hash function, linear algebra step. So I think that one vector matrix product was computed as matrix vector or the opposite. So it wouldn't reduce the security, would just make two implementations incompatible. Um, and also when you fiat shamir stuff, so make sure that everything from the transcript is correctly included in the fiat shamir hash. Um, yeah, I mentioned the composability before. Uh, side channels, um, I think in most cases, People try to people make some effort to avoid you know blatant constant time leaks, but most projects, more many projects, will tell you that uh, they don't they have no guarantee that it's constant time is not designed to be fully constant time regarding with respect to the private values. So the question is when, how could this be exploited or not? Uh, same for the potential RAM leakage. If you have some value that is not zeroized. Um, well, to be honest, I don't think you have to worry much about it. But at the same time, I don't want to tell people, okay, don't worry about it because they will find the one case where it's important. Uh, and another big class of risk is the speculative execution leaks, all these specter type of attacks. Oh, um, go back to the that page. So the, there's a really interesting example of the um, the uh, Fiat Shamir problem um, that was in a an election protocol that I think was used in, or going to be used in Swiss and Australian elections. No. Oh yes, um, but yeah. Yeah, um, so, so they, they weren't hashing um, yeah. uh, the, the instance. Um, and so Swiss law has really um, strict transparency requirements for software used in elections. So it was found in the Swiss election. Um, but the Australian laws are the opposite. They're, it's basically security by uh, obscurity enforced by law. Um, and so, yeah, um, they don't do what Australia did for their election. <laughs> oh, yeah, and this Swiss voting business was quite a story. <laughs> so, yeah, to conclude on this, um, um, well, 
I mean, this talk comes from a frustration I had of not finding bigger bugs than I, than I found. Um, and also from the realization that there hasn't been that many, that many bugs found. So I tried to understand why. So maybe because all the people in this ecosystem are pretty smart, they're not, uh, they know what they're doing. They write secure code. Uh, presumably the use of domain specific languages like Caro, Leo, Noir, will make it easier for people who are less experts to write safe code um, because DSL would do part of the work for them. And also maybe one reason why we didn't have many critical bugs is that there's a very narrow attack surface uh, in terms of what the attacker can, can control and what the proof exposes as a result. So in terms of constant size, uh, constant size proof. Uh, however, what is still worrisome is that yeah, very few people really understand it. ZK snarks uh, at the level needed to find bugs. So even fewer people can really understand the code and have the, the time and knowledge to find these bugs. Uh, we probably need more tooling. I know that there are some efforts ongoing, some people trying to, to do fuzzing, differential fuzzing. I don't know if formal verification can help. Uh, usually not a big fan of verification, but doesn't mean it's completely useless. And also, I think it's just the beginning uh, in terms of ZK technologies. There will be much more projects using ZK proofs. Um, so which means much more value at stake, which means more incentive to, to find bugs and maybe more incentive to withhold the bugs and exploit them as opposed to disclosing them. So we want to avoid the same situation and in the you know, DeFi uh, Web3 business where uh, you, know, you, know, you know what happens. Um, but yeah, well, thank you um, for attending. Thank you for uh, the, the discussions. Uh, and I would like to thank some people and companies who helped me with, uh, with this course. So Aleo, Protocol Labs, um, Kobe, Adrian, Lucas, and, uh, and Mathilde. And I'm happy to use the time left we have for taking more questions. Yeah, <clears throat> Dara, did you have uh, no, your hand? It might be a, it might be a holdover. Uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's just left. Oh, cool. cool. Um, AJP, thank you very much. This is a, a really, really fascinating talk. Um, on your last point, you mentioned, you know, vulnerability and, and high ROI for people to exploit, uh, bugs. Um, you know, just, just try it. Don't, don't open a short position that then later gets liquidated because <laughs> no one knows about the vulnerability. Just joking. Uh, we, should, <laughs> we shouldn't joke about this since, you know, for anyone who, who's watching this in the future, this is a, this is a joke about, um, you know, a six, I think, what is it? $625 million hack of a smart contract bridge that uh, the hacker opened a short position for uh, planning for, for the hack, for the vulnerability to become more widely known. And apparently it wasn't uh, for six days and his That's short position was, was liquidated. Um, <laughs> kind of hilarious. Um, but uh, <laughs> anyway. Also on a yeah, on a centralized exchange, which is yeah. going to yeah. be found. Yeah. Um, but anyway, back to that, back to the topic. Uh, JP, thank you very much. Um, and what we can start questions. Does anybody uh, from the audience have have any questions to start us off? I have a couple, but um, I, I want to turn it over to folks who are listening first. Okay, I'll start with mine. Um, so JP, at the very end, you mentioned a couple things. Um, about, you know, like tools that can help, you know, with, you know, kind of, um, you know, aside from auditing, which is kind of an active preventative measure, that's kind of a weird way to put it, but, you know, you, you know, someone to go in and look at your code and audit it, you know, you mentioned these tools such as fuzzing and formal verification. Um, are you seeing, or, or, you know, is there, do you think in your mind, you know, starting to be more standardization or, or you know, uh, around some of these tools? You know, at Alio, we kind of like built an in-house fuzzer for leo which is our yeah. specific language but it feels like to your point in this call you know in this talk there's many of these same similar bugs in fact multiple projects and it seems like it's crying out for some kind of industry or, or you know higher level tooling that people could use but have you seen anything like that standardization around these tools or is it still pretty in, in its not way? really about the tools but i kind of recall some people mentioning uh, id to standardize encodings of constraint systems of you know, polynomial constraint uh, systems that could be compatible with different implementations of, I don't know, Graph 16 or, or Planck or, or Marlin. Uh, what might be also useful is to have a, 
a kind of standardized interface to allow for differential fuzzing. So let's say you have two implementations of Marlin and you want to make sure that given the same parameters, a proof that is accepted on the first instance will be accepted on the second and likewise uh, will be rejected on both. Um, so I have no idea how, how difficult it is, um, but it, it, it proved very helpful in the context of basic crypto libraries with projects like Wishproof. Um, and also going back to yeah, Wishproof, it's a project where you first an interface, but it's a kind of smart further in the sense that let's say you first ECDS interface, you will, you will know which type of cases are error cases should fail. For example, if you send an old zero signature. So if you know that you're talking to a Grof 16 or Plunk or Mining Prover, you would try to send a malformed proof that is created in such a way, um, maybe to fool the system or to make it crash. So try to cover all these edge cases. But before doing this kind of fancy fuzzing verification stuff, I mean, no, it's not about how much audits you throw the project. It's you know about your internal you know security SDLC process, starting with things as basic as tests, as unit tests, um, and as documentation and integration tests. So you know first have right set of unit tests, uh, maybe new CI pipe, pipeline, and then start doing some fuzzing. Um, but don't waste your time investing in formal verification before you have you know. A good uh, CI pipeline. Yeah. Um, the, so, so for fuzzing, uh, an issue with fuzzing cryptography is that um, often the the cases that you're trying to hit um, have very low probability um, when given random input. Yes. I, I, even to the to the point where it's difficult to get to the point in the code where um, where the error where the bug actually is. Yeah. Um, so, I, I mean, I know a potential um, way of getting around that would be to use, say, an SMT solver to um, to try and um, solve for inputs that get that get you further into the um, the program. Um, do you know of any other approaches? Do you think that's a practical approach? Yeah, yeah, I agree that first thing I've seen people trying to first hash functions. I mean, which is completely useless because it's a straight line program. Um, what I also found very useful, I've seen some projects organizing internal audits. So like, you know, for one week, you create a small task force and people who know the code and they really focus on finding bugs and maybe developing some new tools. Um, mm -hmm. And if you, if you hire like external auditors, you want to make sure, well, first of all, they have the capability to, capability to help and maybe that I get enough time to well understand what code they're looking at, what can go wrong, and that you don't start directly by looking at the code because it's well, not useless, but not a good regional investment. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say you must have to spend as much effort developing tooling as um, of so writing the, the proof system and circuits in the first place. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because otherwise you, you're not going to be able to, to understand or visualize your circuits. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's definitely been a problem with Zcash. We do have some tools, um, but not enough and, and not enough time to build them. Yeah. And knowing where to focus your effort, because that's a, a project with the, the complexity of audio with the multiple layers of of complexity in the multiple proving systems, then you might have perfectly fine, uh, you know, ZK proofs and uh, constant systems. But then at the application layer, you forget one minus sign or you forget one variable and... Yeah, we, we just found a bug in um, Orchard that was, it was actually a completeness bug. Um, but um, we'd made a change to the, the protocol um, to so that there were instead of having one incoming viewing key for a note, so there, there were two possible incoming viewing keys, um, and we hadn't updated the implementation. Um, so sometimes it was using the wrong key, um, and therefore the the proof verification was failing. Um, so so we had a little bit of a panic when we thought this was um, 
some complicated uh, subtle bug in the circuit that actually was just using the, the wrong instance. Don't, don't you think there's some level of security by obscurity because it's so hard to approach? It takes so much you know, experience that most likely these bugs would be found by the teams, by the developers, uh, as opposed to by you no know, bad guys. I mean, in principle, a bad guy, if, if they're willing to put enough time into it, they can learn a protocol, they can learn an implementation, um, and they can find anything that you could find. Uh, it's, it's really difficult for them. Um, but how do you know that, for example, that the attacker isn't um, some former employee or, yeah, um, <laughs> yeah you, or an auditor for that matter? Um, yeah. yeah, so th the, there are enough people who could potentially understand this stuff that you do have to worry about that, um, even if it's unlikely. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's yeah. interesting going back to the point that, that you talked about, both of you with regard to tooling, um, it does feel like that, you know, because many of these systems are so nascent, um, you know, there's an opportunity to build better tooling, as you said, there are just to even visualize in some cases, like what, you know, what is happening. And uh, yeah, I mean, Anna, I was thinking about the grants, you know, the ecos, the kind of ZK grants program that you run, like something like that feels like a perfect thing for like, some kind of grant for a team to go and build something that would be beneficial for, you know, for all. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, what do they say, you know, kind of the, at least not, not with regard to things like tools like fuzzing, but with regard to testing, certainly these basics that we kind of like if all software engineering, you know, you know, are just good or we are just generally good software engineering practices. And I think it's, it feels like there's still quite a long way to go just with regards to kind of enforcing and, and doing the basics across the board. Um, yeah. and, and it's difficult. Well, also Go ahead. Um, choice of programming language. Uh, I mean, a, a lot of code now is being written in Rust. There's still a lot of code in C++, C um, um, languages uh, without strong type systems. Um, yeah, it, it kind of makes me nervous how much. Um, yeah, actually, on, on that point, I have a question. So what, I mean, you audited, I think have you it's audited systems that are both Rust and C++. Is there any other languages represented, JP, that you've, systems you've audited? Well, I've seen some projects using uh, Go or uh, I think even JavaScript or TypeScript, but most of them are in, in Rust now. So uh, and now you have Zebra from, from Zcash. Uh, um, like all the arc, arc works is in, is in Rust. I think Rust is very good language for this, this type of project. Got it. Yeah, I was just curious. You said basically you answered the question at the end there. I was curious if you had kind of a preference or you thought that certain languages were more potentially practical for this problem. And it sounds like, I mean, as most people have already concluded, Rust is certainly one of the better, better ones, if not the best. Yeah. I, I mean, the, there is um, OCaml being used by O1 Labs. Yes, we don't have uh, we don't have Isaac here, to, unfortunately, to to tell us uh, the benefits of OCaml, which I'm sure are many. I'm not you know very educated and I I, so. I really like OCaml. Um, but yeah, if you wanted a, a garbage collected safe language, it's, you, you can do a lot worse than OCaml. Um, obviously, a little bit more difficult to find people who are familiar with it. Yeah, well, it's interesting. I mean, like to your, this brings goes back to your point there around the expertise, and and JP, you made this point like the security by obscurity just simply because it's too obscure for all, but you know, some, some tiny sliver of the population to ever understand what's actually happening under the hood. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think it feels like, I mean, it, it, do, you, do you view this as, as, as something that, I mean, maybe this even extends beyond zero knowledge, but just cryptography in general, do you think, you know, these systems get more complex as there's more moving parts as protocols kind of extend up the stack um, you know, how do you address that problem where, you know, there's very few people and you even mentioned this, you know, when you said, Hey, the bet, the best position people to spot bugs are the teams themselves. But in many cases, even the teams, you know, that are working on separate pieces of it. And there's sometimes no one actually seeing all of the parts as they're fitting together. So how do you think you, you address that? Well, what scares me is well, what I call state machine bugs. Uh, cause ultimately you have a stateful system. Um, and entering, you know, after a sequence of events in a state uh, that is insecure. But first of all, you have to know what is in, in a secure state. 
and how this insecure cell will well, interact with your proving system and what role your proving system will, will play. And if I yeah, take the case of Alio, it's an example where I was really trying to reason about, okay, what type of viable combination, what type of input would be wrong to have here? And how can we make sure that this will be rejected, detected? Um, so it was very, very unclear to me because it's yeah. like when you analyze consensus, consensus protocol on paper, it's relatively easy to understand what happens. And then you simulate it, you're like, oh shit, it's crashing, what happened? And <laughs> there are many types of bugs that you can only observe by you know running it in practice because it's too nonlinear to anticipate what's going to happen. And there are way too many different uh, possibilities. Um, the, 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 the bug that I just mentioned about um, the orchard circuit, the, the way we actually found which part of the circuit it was, uh, well, it wasn't a circuit bug, but which part of the instance was wrong. It's just commenting out bits of the circuit and seeing whether it, it, it passed or not. Um, so yeah, it, some kind of automated way to do things like that or um, yeah. and be yeah. really useful. What also might happen is, uh, you know, what you've seen with crypto, but suddenly when crypto becomes easier to use, you have better you know, interfaces, better libraries, uh, then everybody starts using it, even people who don't know what they're doing. So perhaps the same might happen with, you know, ZK proving systems when they become much easier to use, where you have all these DSLs, then everybody can be a cryptographer, everybody can do ZK systems. Um, and I've seen some projects already that look a bit sketchy to me. They, they claim to use ZK technology, but you don't know what they're doing and you don't know if they know what they're doing. So. I, I mean, it's, it's inevitable that, that more people will learn the technology and therefore there'll be a larger pool of potential attackers. So it's kind of a race against time to, yeah. to build this this tooling, these languages that allow us to, to avoid the bugs before that happens. Um, it's, it's definitely not a bad thing that, that more people are learning how to, um, to, uh, to do ZK stuff, um, even though it does increase the pull of attackers. Yeah, yeah. well, maybe now's a good time to highlight some of the great work that uh, Anna and Kobe uh, have been doing on the ZK hack side, trying to onboard new people into this world and yeah. getting them interested in it. And uh, yeah, hopefully, yeah, hopefully some of those people will go on to start cool projects and hopefully some of them will build tools that help make things more secure. And maybe some will even become auditors uh, go work for you, JP. Mm -hmm. cool. um, anyone else, I guess we're down to just a few folks here. Anyone else have any um Final questions for JP? All right, awesome. Well, um, thank you very much, JP. I really appreciate, um, you know, we all really appreciate you coming on uh, ZK Study Club today. I think everyone learned a lot and I really enjoyed the conversation. So thanks again for being here. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, everyone.